morning, everybody. We're just getting, we're running just a tad bit behind because new IFR is released. Uh, um, IFR is in terms, um, I don't know, my brain's having up, just rules and regulations for the PVP yesterday. So we were just trying to really read over them and understand them. They were released yesterday afternoon. So just catching up a little bit here. Everybody had a nice weekend. We've got 39 people on. Just give it two more minutes and then we're going to get started. Um, I have my lovely IFRs here, all highlighted, exciting. If anybody wants some light reading for later, I'm happy to share the link. All right, we're gonna get going. Um, I'm Erin with Straight Line. Um, we're a accounting firm that specializes in working with small businesses. Um, been providing a lot of education to our clients and business community all through this um, wonderful time since um, March. Um, we have always been proactive with trying to educate our clients. Um, in the business community and trying to stay on top of things. And we actually plan on doing a, quite a bit more of it in the future and providing some more education on just basics and how to run a business, finance, personal and whatnot. But right now we're gonna focus on the PVP forgiveness. And we did a, we did do a webinar um, a couple weeks, uh, I think it was a couple weeks ago. And um, sorry, I'm trying to get my, thing up. I don't know what just happened. Um, a few weeks ago on the PPP forgiveness and it's still, um, there's not, hasn't been a ton of changes, but there's been a couple going on. So what we're going to do is we're not going to dive in as deep as I usually do. I'm going to do an overview of, of a brief overview of what we discussed the last webinar. If you didn't catch the last webinar, it is recorded. It is available through our Facebook page, um, straight line business owner survival guide. And we did email it out. We can also send it out. Um, the, House passed the most recent bill this past Thursday night, and it's still sitting in Senate. We were hoping it would be passed by now, but it hasn't been, but I do have some stuff to go over. And also wanted to clarify some of the sole proprietor, the Schedule C um, questions. Um, and so we're hopefully, probably gonna keep this within an hour as opposed to going like the two hours that it's been going into. So um, let me just get this going now. Bear with me one minute for some reason. I don't want to. All right. All right. And it's not six one, it's six two, but that's okay. Um, so again, we're going over the loan forgiveness, just a brief overview. It will not be nearly as in-depth or detailed. Again, if you want the super in detail, in-depth one, you can um, check out the one we did a couple weeks ago. Housekeeping really quick. All questions can be asked in the Q&A section. Um, we disabled the chat feature just to make it a little more streamlined and easy. You can raise your, we are, we are going to do an open forum Q&A section at the end of this. You just have to raise your hand. We'll unmute you. You can ask a question. Um, we will have the slides and the webinar itself um, available to email and we'll have it on our straight line owners business survival guide Facebook page. 
please check your spam or junk filters to make sure that you we have you have our domain added. So that's added to safe senders list. A lot of people's um, emails been going to their junk or spam. And if you haven't already, please join our Facebook group, Straight Lines Business Owner Survival Guide. Amber will actually put that in the chat dialogue at some point. Amber is on to help me with questions. She's been dealing a ton with our planning with our clients directly and knows a lot. Um, again, this is not to be used as legal advice. If you need something specific for your business, we do recommend that you speak to a professional directly. Um, so I cannot answer any direct questions about your business necessarily, but um, we'll do our best to help you. So short agenda, uh, we're gonna go over the pending legislation because there's a lot of questions about pending legislation. Um, the first thing is the legislation has not passed. People keep thinking it has passed. It passed the House, it has not passed the Senate nor been signed off by the president. So we hope that the pending legislation um, for the most part is gonna be kept, but it probably, there probably will be some minor changes. Um, and hopefully they get to that, hopefully by the end of the week at the latest. We're gonna go over the PPP forgiveness overview and then we're gonna, Part of that is touch on sole proprietors. And I believe I spelled that wrong. Again, we we're doing this very last minute trying to read the most recent IFR. So I apologize for any grammatical mistakes. I thought the content was more important. Um, so pending Senate approval, the House passed the bill last Thursday night. It's currently being reviewed by the Senate. So some of the stuff in there is to extend the covered period from eight weeks to 24 or 16 or 24 weeks. Um, that would actually help out a tremendous amount of companies that received the funds and are just spending it, I guess, just because they have to. So what we're kind of telling our clients right now is to sort of um, sit and wait and see what happens. Um, don't issue those bonuses out yet. Just kind of see what goes on. If they do extend it, again, that will help. Um, if you've already, if you're already six, seven weeks in, I don't know what that's going to mean for you. You could just be sort of, you spent the funds and it is what it is. I don't know if you're gonna be able to go back and apply for more funds. I think that would be nice for them to do if they were going to extend it for 24 weeks, but I don't know. The other thing that they're, they're most likely going to pass through, they're gonna take out that 75% that you have to spend on payroll costs, they're probably gonna reduce it to around 60%. That's the number uh, in the house bill. Um, hopefully that, that's what they do, at least 60%. So that means you can, you don't have to spend the, all the, the loan funds on 75% and go down to 60% on the payroll costs. Also, um, they're gonna push back or put, proposing to push back the deadline of rehiring employees from June 30th to December 31st, which makes a lot of sense, especially if you're in Massachusetts or a state like that, like ours, and everything is still pretty much closed because how can you rehire people? if you can't open, especially for restaurants and seasonal, um, you know, um, wedding venues, all that stuff. Also, what they wanna do is extend the loan payment terms uh, from a two-year term to a five-year term for anything that's not forgiven, which is actually very, very much better. And they are probably gonna keep the 1% interest rate. Um, in our prior webinar, we had discussed proposed uh, ex expenses that they were thinking about adding in, such as at COVID related expenses. So if you had to pur purchase PPE um, or maybe put a drive-through window in because you had to do takeout or takeout window, I should say, um, that was originally proposed. It was not part of the house bill. I don't know if the Senate will add it, but that's why I took it out of this presentation because I don't think it's actually going to be included, but we don't know for sure. It would be nice if they did. Either way, we still recommend you keep track of those kind of expenses. All right, so I just wanna be clear on that again. This has not passed. So all the things you keep saying, seeing in the news and all that, it has, it's not official yet. So for all our clients, like I said, we're just telling them to sit tight and wait. Hopefully they have, hopefully by the end of the week, we are really hoping this, you know, early this week they do it. But I just wanna reiterate, these are not final yet. So we still are working on old, for, you know, the, the, um, the forgiveness application that we have and the guidance that was released right around then around May 15th. Okay, so this is a review of the prior webinar we did. Um, calculating owner's payroll costs. This is one of the big, big changes and there was actually another change that took place last week that in my opinion, um, kind of screwed over owner employees of corporations a little bit more. Um, so for self-employed, if you have a Schedule C and you file on your Form 1040, um, instead of taking that full 15,000 385, you can take that. However, it is limited by your 2000, 
19 net income. So if you only made, if your net income in 2019 was $80,000, you cannot take the full 15,385. You are limited, whatever, 15, uh, you took, you made $80,000, you divide that by 52 times eight, you can take $12,307 um, and that's forgivable. They, so that's how you calculate what self-employed individuals can take as quote unquote pay, um, which changed. And I think that really was not very nice. Um, same idea with the general partnerships. So if you have a K-1, you have a 1065, similar idea. It's, it's, it's um, capped at what your net income, your self-employment income was. And then for owner employees of S Corps, corporation, the C Corp, um, it's the same idea, 2019 income, your, your growth, but it was your gross wages. So it's not the income that's on your K-1. So if you're an S Corp owner, you usually take wages and then you also have net income from your K-1 that passes through to your personal tax return. What they're doing with owner employees of these corporations are only taking your 2019 gross wages that was paid through a W-2. So for our clients, a lot of people don't take $100,000 of a paycheck because that's kind of, that's not the best tax planning advice depending on the, the size and the nature of the business. Uh, obviously, if you're a very large corporation, sometimes it makes sense to take paychecks over $100,000, but for a lot of smaller businesses, that doesn't make any sense. So this is where I got really kind of upset by this because it really kind of screwed people over. The other thing that they did last week was, I didn't put it in here, but it's just another bullet point is if you have a couple entities that you got the PPP loan through and you take paychecks through both of them, I actually do this, um, you are limited to 15,385 across all of your entities total. So you can only take 15,385 across all of your entities. So if you have more than one entity, again, that you took the PPP loan, you got the PPP loan through and um, you are an owner and you're trying to use your wages to, um, as part of the planning, now you can only take a total of 15,385 and this 15,385 includes your owner health insurance premiums and your employer retirement contributions, which is also new. So not only your gross wages, you're limited by your gross wages, but now you, you can't even count the amount that you're paying towards your health insurance or retirement above the 15,385 total. So if you have questions about that right now, I'm happy to answer it since it's, a little confusing, but what they did, in my opinion, was not only did they cap it at 385 with when they released the PPP applica forgiveness application, but then a week later they said, oh, you're an S Corp or a C Corp owner. Here's some more bad news, I guess. So, because we were using owner health insurance premiums and retirement as in addition or above the 15385, and a couple of our clients do have multiple entities that they took the PPP loan through. All right, so I just wanted to, okay, I was just reading a question, I apologize. Um, so for Schedule C filers, so if you have a Schedule C, you could be a single member LLC, you could be a Schedule C under your social, you could be a Schedule C under a tax ID. Um, the, the rules for Schedule C on the allowable expenses have been very, very vague. And um, the reason why we're a little behind this morning is because Amber and I were just digging through the IFRs um, that have been released and trying to go read through tax legislation and tax code. I don't know if you can see that, me holding it up, I don't think so. But we wanted to try to um, clarify a little bit. So for the forgiveness portion for your pay, we just talked about that. It's limited to your 2019 net income. You take net income, divide by 52, multiply by eight, that's your what you can take as forgivable expenses as the as the owner of the business. Um, if you if you do have if you also have a if you have schedule e and you also run payroll for your regular employees, those normal payroll costs are allowable. So their gross wages plus the employer portion of the health insurance retirement match, the state unemployment, that's normal because those are your employees. So those are allowable. It's just limited for yourself on how much you could take out. The expenses. Uh, the non-payroll costs that are included or forgivable, including the forgiveness, they, they, do have, they do have some more, but it's also with stipulations. So, um, all, so all of the non-payroll costs allowable for other entities, if you, want, if you want a whole list of them, you can go back and um, either get the slides from our old webinars or um, 
watch the webinars. We, I just didn't really want to kind of beat a dead horse with that. We've gone over it quite a bit. And we have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, literature to give to you if you want to have that as a, as, you know, a go a go to for reference. But um, so that's, you know, utilities, um, rent, mortgage, interest paid, um, interest paid on real or personal property. But they also allowed, there's also auto leases are allowed. So if you have an auto lease that's allowed, also fuel for automobiles is allowed. But here is a stipulation here, and this is sort of, um, I'm just reading another question. This is where the stipulations come in. So based on the IFRs, it says, I'm gonna actually read it to you, exciting stuff here. Um, let me just back up. It's a really long sentence here. I'm just gonna start business rent payments. Exa example, a warehouse where you store business equipment or vehicle where you use to perform your business and business utility payments. Example, the cost of electricity in the warehouse you, you rent or gas, you drive, I'm sorry, you use driving your business vehicle. You must have claimed, here's the stipulation. You must have claimed or be entitled to claim a deduction for such expenses on 2019 form 1040 schedule C for them to be permissible use during the eight week period following this during the eight week covered period. So what this is saying is basically under 2019 schedule C, you really should have shown that you took these expenses as opposed to mileage. So a lot of people take mileage, they don't take actual expenses. Actual expenses would be depreciation, plus fuel costs, repairs, that kind of stuff. If you took mileage, I've, I've gotten contradicting um, opinions on this. You, you're either SOL, I was just told, so shit out of luck. If you took mileage and you can't take these, um, the fuel for autos, or it says, it says right here, entitled to claim a deduction for such expenses. So it depends, I guess, on how the bank will interpret it. Um, so basically what I'm saying is you could, you might be able to use it as forgiveness, it just might depend on what your bank decides to do or if they come up with clearer guidance on it. And the same thing goes for utilities paid out of your, out of your Schedule C. So typically if you're a Schedule C and like you, you don't have an office, you typically take, you file a home office. So you pay all your stuff normally, personally through your home. So your NSTAR, your cable, and then you just take a portion of that expenses and then it goes on a, um, a special form. You get a home office, I think it's the 8829. And then that goes through. So this says specifically the same idea. It was directly basically reported on your Schedule C as a utility expense. Again, this is sort of open for interpretation, I believe, um, but I'm not sure because if you've reported a home office last year in 2019, then maybe you can take it, but it wasn't directly reported on the Schedule C. Kind of was, but not really. So um, I know I'm not giving you exact answers. Unfortunately, we don't have exact answers. I'm reading directly off of the IFRs, the regulations that were released. And I, I'm really sorry, but they're not clear. So I just want to give an example of rent. People ask, okay, well, can I what rent for storage and stuff like that? Yes, that is that is allowable. Um, so if you have you pay for a bay or something like that where you store your mowers or whatnot, that is allowable as expenses. The other thing I wanted to touch upon is the covered period. Well, I'll actually I'll go over the covered period in a minute. Um, so someone just asked a question, how to calculate payroll costs for a Schedule C filer who had a 2019 loss because the business just started at the end of 2019 where the real operation started in January 2020 and the company is profitable from, from January 2020. I don't know that answer because they have not talked about new businesses at all in any of these rules. So if you can see my face right now, I don't really know what to say. So if you, I don't, I'm, I'm assuming you must have gotten a PPP loan based on a fiscal year period, which would have been April 1st through March 31st. You probably got the loan proceeds based on, I'm assuming, when you started being profitable in 2020. I have no idea what they're going to do with that because in my opinion, they let us take a fiscal year period to choose the loan amount, but then they said, oh no, the only way you can get forgiveness for the expenses is using the calendar year period, which makes no sense to me. So I don't know the answer to that question and they don't really address any new businesses at all. So I guess what I'm thinking is they might just see what your expenses were and just forgive them for if you're a new business. But if you open in 2019, I'm not positive because there's no real answers. Um, 
if you, I mean, if you have straight payroll costs and you have payroll costs for your employees, that's fine. That's, that's cut and dry, but um, sorry, FK. I don't know the exact answer for that. Unfortunately, I wish I did. Um, okay, let me move on. So the, I just want to reiterate this. We went over the last webinar. So these are for paid and incurred expenses. So, so what they did was to be able to have a, amounts forgiven, you have to pay you, it's for expense, expenses paid and in, in cost incurred and payments made during the covered period. So what we have discovered this, this means is that let's say your eight week period starts on June 1st. I'm gonna actually read this example right here, okay? A borrower's covered period begins on June 1st and ends on July 26th, okay? The borrower pays its May and June electricity bill during the covered period. So obviously you got your May bill and you paid it in June, but you didn't, you didn't have the loan, you didn't have the covered period until June 1st. And pays its July electricity bill on August 10th, which is the next regular billing date. The borrower may seek loan forgiveness for its May and June electricity bills because they were paid during the covered period. In addition, the borrower may seek loan forgiveness for the portion of its July electricity bill through July 26, the end of the covered period, because it was incurred during the covered period and paid on the next bill, regular billing date. So what that is saying is, okay, yeah, you paid your May, you may, and this is directly off the IFR, you paid your May electricity bill during the covered period, so that's payments made, that's covered. And then you paid your July bill in August. It's covered up until the electricity, the electricity you use through July 26. So in my opinion, I think banks are just going to say, okay, you paid the bill. It was for July during the cover period. Don't give us a prorated electricity, electrical, electrical use date through July 26. I have no idea how that's even possible, but that does give some companies a little bit of leeway for expenses paid, which is good. Um, so you have it basically they're combining what's called like a cash and accrual basis of type of accounting, um, which will help people for these kind of expenses. Um, but it doesn't have to be both paid and occurred. It can be either or, it can be mixed, whatever. Um, so it does allow you to include all check dates in your 56 day period. So we had so another clarification of this we believe is that if you had a payroll date, a check, a check date fall like right around when you got the PPP loan. So either on the day or the day after, we believe that's included in the, in the, in the eight week period. And then let's say your eight week period ends at July 26 and you, your next pay period is August, your check date. I apologize. Your check date is like August 2nd. That should count too, because you're paying for the, the pay period during the 56 day period. So you're sort of like, really expanding your eight week period is covering more like 10 weeks, not just eight weeks, because you took the front, the very front, you took the front end where you cut, you, you cut a check right when you received the funds for the payroll, even though it covered a pay period prior to receiving the funds. And then you're cutting a check after the, the covered period end, but it's, but it's including payroll, a payroll period during the covered period. And that if you do, if, if you do need to prorate it, you know, down to the July 26th date. For payroll, that's easier to do because you know the hours work for every, every, every single employee. So that won't that be, be that hard to break out. Okay. All right, let me just see here. Um, okay. So another thing that they added, um, which I did go over the last webinar is covered period versus alternate, alternative covered period. So this is a really good thing for some of our clients that, that are um, that received the funds but really weren't open yet. So when you receive the PPP funds in your bank account, eight week, 56 days time frame is called a covered period begins. So if you're a biweekly payer, so if your check date, if your check date is uh, every um, is biweekly every other week or more frequent, so weekly, you can actually elect an alternative alternative payroll covered period. So it's payroll covered period. So if I receive the funds on um, June 1st and my payroll and I'm in the middle of a payroll period, I don't actually have to elect my covered payroll period until the start of my next pay period. So let's say I'm weekly. I get a June 1st. June 1st is a Monday. 
My next pay period starts this coming Sunday. So my payroll period doesn't actually even have to start until next Sunday. My ch first check date will be a week after that, two, basically almost two weeks from now. So that will actually allow people to spread their payroll costs out farther because they can choose a farther election date to start the payroll. So for people that are not open yet or, or are slowly opening, that will really help. However, that's only for the payroll costs. If you elect that period, your eight week covered period for the non-payroll costs still remains the day that you receive the funds. So right now it's eight weeks, it could be extended out. So um, I know that's confusing, but you can have alternative payroll period for your payroll costs, but your, your other covered period <laughs> is the day you receive the funds. So um, that's, it is helpful because example, we had a client that received funds. Um, they elected the alternative payroll period, but paid, pay, but paid non-payroll cost expense during the week before the pay period started. So they can actually count both, which is great. Um, someone just asked a question we received. PVP loan on April 24th. Do I deduct only May and June health insurance costs? Can I slide in April's bill also if I pay um, July health insurance bill, which I receive around 10 days before and a month? Can I get early too? So this is, oh, that's Deb. Um, basically the example I just gave is yes. As long as you, you can pay the April bill, if you got it, if you, uh, after you receive the funds, you can, then if you pay the, May and June, you could pay it while you, you know, during the covered period or even a little after. But it's going to be prorated, I think, um, until the covered period is over. Okay. So we just went over this. I um, sort of beat a dead horse the last time because it's confusing. So just to be clear, if you're bi weekly or weekly, you can elect this cover period. Again, it's only for payroll costs, which can be very helpful, but for non-payroll costs, your eight week period starts the day that you receive the funds or covered period, whatever they happen to be, it happens to be. Um, okay. Again, it, it could cover about 10 weeks of payroll, which is really helpful for people. Another thing I wanna go over is there's no deduction for the PPP expenses. I did go over this last time. They, 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 um, the loan forgiveness is not taxable. However, you can did not deduct the expenses. So basically it's a wash. So again, this is gonna be a lot of tax planning involved, especially for basically every business owner. So everything has to be really, really accounted for and um, gone over with a fine tooth comb basically, because you, I don't know how it's gonna be reported in the tax return, but you do, will need to do some extensive tax planning and preparation for this. And as of right now, this, the deductibility of the expenses is not sitting in legislation as part of the House bill to be, to be reversed. So this is a, just a quick little screenshot of um, non-payroll costs like expenses that are allowable or not and if they're forgivable or not. So I'm, I don't probably don't really need to read them to you, but mortgage interest payments, yes and yes, rent, yes and yes. Rent again is for like if you have a, a warehouse or something like that. Also auto lease is, is included. Um, electricity, gas, water, transportation. So transportation has been one of those weird questions. Some states have like transportation costs like they have to pay for highways, a special tax they get, I guess. I think if you look in your utility bill, sometimes there's transportation costs on your utility bill. And it also includes, um, like we said, fuel for those Schedule C folks. Um, it's supposed to be for internet only. Debbie is asking about TV, including your Comcast bill. However, for um, businesses, we believe it's the entire utility bill. I mean, God help the bank that has to break this out. All this, um, I don't know how they'd actually break all of that out. So it's the entire utility bill for your business for Comcast bill as far as I'm concerned, because they change everything every day, so. Um, cell phone, yes, yes. And one of the biggest questions that people have been having 
It doesn't have to be in the name of the business. I know a lot of my clients have cell phones, including myself. It's in my name, not my business name, but I pay it through the business. I'm putting that through. I pay through the business. I have a history of paying it for myself. I'm going to put, I'm going to put that through. So just because it's not in the name of your business, um, doesn't necessarily mean it won't be forgiven. However, health insurance does need to be in the name of the business. Okay. So if you are going to, if you are an employer health and you have a plan, you do have to have the name of the business. So that is one of the things that does have to be in the name of the business. And so do auto leases too. Auto leases have to be in the name of the business. Then here's the payroll costs. Um, again, I don't really want to read this, read through this. We will have this as a handout available, but I just wanted to put this in here so you guys could read through it just to see what it was. Um, workers comp has become a huge question. Um, if that's included, that is not, that is not forgivable. It's not allowable expense, nothing like that. Um, retirement plan. Again, the retirement plan employer match is not included for schedule C people or, um, or uh, partnerships. K1, if they get a 1065 K1, um, it's not included. And also it's limited if you are a S corp owner. Um, Paige is asking, so are you are, you are being taxed twice from the income if you are an LLC sole employer owner. Wages paid to the owner with W-2 are taxed, plus on the company side, they are not deductible, aka, well, if you are an LLC um, and you're a single member LLC, you have not elect S-Corp status, you should not be taking a W-2 wage as an owner it's against tax code. Um, but yes, the, if like, let's say, let's say your example was an S-Corp, um, page, then yes, that's basically what's happening. So a lot of these owners are taking payroll checks, maybe higher than they normally would, or just taking it. They cannot deduct it and it's on their, on their corp. So kind of, yeah, they're kind of being double taxed. Yes, that's, yep. Mm -hmm. That's why there's such a big controversy of the, over the expenses not being deductible, even though, so logically it makes sense. You're getting a free loan. So why should you deduct the expenses? But on the flip side, you have the owners that are going to have a big tax problem. So really it's not a free loan in a way. Okay. So quickly again, how to achieve maximum loan forgiveness. Don't go this alone pretty much is what we're recommending, but planning, you'll need to project how your funds will be used on authorized expenses. So like I said, in the beginning of this, our, our clients were just telling them pretty much to sit tight right now. If they just have regular payroll costs, just pay the regular payroll costs. Um, we don't want people just spending money because they have to spend it. Because if they extend this out, you're going to have a lot longer to spend the money. And then for most people, it'll be no problem. But we, you got to kind of have a, a game plan going on here. So um, an execution, you got to review it constantly. We have, we review it with our clients weekly. Um, obviously if they extend it out weekly will not be feasible um, for on our end or, and it's really not gonna be necessary for our clients because it'll be a lot easier to spend the funds over 24 weeks as opposed. So um, benefits do not exam, um, Irene, it depends on how they're being deducted from your pay, from your employee's pay. If they're, if, if life insurance is not being, well, you know, a post-tax so Ciliary benefits aren't included at all. So life, um, life, disability, those kind of things. It's strictly like health, dental, vision. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, if, you, if you're deducting it from your employee's pay, then you're, then you're. Exactly. Yeah. And then it's, then it's, a, then it, then you essentially are, but that's for their gross wages. So that's sort of a tax thing. Um, I, I really don't know if we answered your question, but no, no, no life, no disability. State, however, Massachusetts, if you're an employer over 25 or more, you're contributing to the MAPFML and there's other states that have something similar, then that is included because it's considered a tax, not like an actual insurance. Um, okay, document everything. The Right now, the forgiveness application is gonna have you send it, submit in all of your receipts, canceled checks, payroll reports, everything. Um, your books should be, record keeping your books should be super super clear um they i just read something they say the banks are gonna take about five months to um process these loan applications your forgiveness application the other thing is banks are really really pushing to ease up the um loan forgiveness application um 
for anything under $350,000, which obviously would be huge for um, most, most clients, most, most business owners. Um, there's, I, I cannot see how any bank is going to be able to review the type of detail that needs to go in right now. The forgiveness application, you have to list out every single employee and detail out their, their authorized expenses. I just, I, banks can barely read an um, income statement, a profit, you know, profit loss of balance sheet and break out depreciation, stuff like that. I don't know how they're going to read payroll reports. So um, hopefully the, the banks, I mean, they're obviously very influential with the government. So hopefully they really um, are able to simplify the, the forgiveness application process. Um, and there has been a lot of rumors. I got all at one day, they must have had on the news um, about just automatically forgiving everything, all loans under a certain amount. I've heard 100,000, 50,000, 1 million, all these amounts have been crazy. I haven't heard that at all. Like it's nothing official or formal. It's basically just rumors, lovely rumors, but just rumors. Um, so as of right now, there isn't just like a blanket amount that you'll just be forgiven. Um, so again, to, to apply for loan forgiveness, you have that 11 page application. It's not currently in the, in the current bill to change the application, but it doesn't really need to be. They can just change it when they feel like it because that's what they do. Um, I'm hoping they really simplify it. Um, I'm hoping we see a change like that in the next week or so because a lot of companies are, are, have reached their eight week period or are basically at their eight week period that first got the funds. Um, again, I, I just can't imagine banks going through that loan application, that forgiveness application. Um, they basically have to process the loan twice is how it goes, but even more stringent, it's crazy. Um, again, all these documentation you're gonna need. So keep, keep track of it all make sure you're putting it in a separate folder on your computer or whatever and have it ready to go. And I would also, again, save all this information for your accounting accountant and make, make, make them aware that you've got this loan if they don't know, somehow they don't know. Um, if they don't know, you should call us because they should know. Um, <laughs> um, all right, um, let me just see if, if you haven't, I'm gonna read some questions. If you have until the end of the year to have FTE, you cannot apply or receive forgiveness to the same number of FTE as prior. I don't know, Anna, Anna, I don't know when you can apply. If they if they push those things out to six to twelve thirty one, I'm I'm not positive um, what they're going to do for the forgiveness application. Um, if they push out the FTE, I'm assuming if you meet the FTE requirement before that, you can apply before that. I'm not sure. Um, as a sole proprietor receiving unemployment, can I still take the PPP loan and repay it at 1% in the end? Susan, you can, but you are supposed to, you're required to pay it, you're, I'm sorry, required to use the funds only on the allowable expenses. If you use it for something else, like let's say you need to go invest in your building and do a build out for a lease build, a lease build out or something like that, you can't do that. It's actually considered fraud. So um, if you use on the allowable expenses, like payroll and, those other things, then yes, you can do that. Um, we'll, we'll, again, we'll, will we be able to apply for forgiveness once we've expended all the funding or to wait till the deadline, whatever it may be? I think it's one or the other. If, 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 you've, if you meet it, like okay, this is what my plan is. I plan on applying as soon as I've hit all the qualifications, all the requirements. I, I'm not gonna wait till December 31st to do it. That's for sure, unless, I, unless I'm required to, but I don't think so. So if I've hit my FTE count and all that other stuff, I'm gonna go apply. I'm not gonna wait till, in case I lose another employee or something like that. Okay, so what if you don't get forgiveness? So unfortunately, there's a very real possibility that, that you may not meet qualifications to receive 100% forgiveness. Obviously, if they extend the um, covered period, that will really relieve a lot of businesses. I would say like 75% of businesses That'd be a huge relief to them um, and, and will give you much more forgiveness. Um, but you will have a, a loan to pay back at 1% interest. It's currently at a two year term there. They want to um, extend it to five years, which is a much more reasonable payback term. Um, payments start on the seventh month after the loan disbursement date. So um, you have six months, um, no payments in the seventh, seventh month, you do have to start paying. Um, no, you cannot deduct any type of pay expenses, like payroll service fees, accounting fees, no. No type of professional expenses, unless you receive the HH 
CRA or something credit. That's if you are a medical company and you build Medicare last year, and that's a whole different ball of wax right there. You're welcome, Deb. Um, trust me, I wish they could have, because now you're adding payroll when you probably didn't need it. So um, they also said that a lot of these applications will take you know three to seven minutes. So they're probably assuming that any any business owner can do their own payroll. So they probably, but they, they clearly have no sense of reality when it comes to running a business because no one actually that makes the decisions um, pertinent to these loans has ever actually ever cut a paycheck for an employee, I'm sure. So they have no idea what it's actually right like to run a business, but they can write the rules that do. Um, you may pay any amount, you know, so you can prepay it without any penalty. So if you have the funds and you just want to pay it back, you can, then no big deal. Um, and the, we believe the loan can be refinanced into an EIDL loan. We're not positive. I should have put that asterisk there. I forgot there again, but, um, so do IRA and Roth IRA contributions qualify as retirement savings or for VVB forgiveness? Um, not for a S corp or a corp. We believe they qualify for it. Well, no, cause you know, they no, no, for schedule C no, because you can't include retirement contributions. Um, no. JB, as of right now, no, unless you have unless you have a company plan under your corp and you're paying it through and then you're still limited by if you're an owner by the amount of the 15385. Um, our school year is now over and I'm an employee who's going back to work. If I put it in writing that she has done being employed, then I can take her off payroll and not keep paying her for the eight week period. Marie, um, my, my interpretation of this is that she would have to leave on her own will. So it would be more something where she would have to no. resign, so to speak, in writing for you. Um, no, not necessarily. If they're, if they're terminated for cause. For uh, cause. Right. So this not really like you're trying to terminate her. It's that she's leaving because she's going back to school. So what, what, I, I'm kind of confused by the question, I think. I think I'm confused, confused by the question. I have an employee back who- Back to school, she clarified. The employee is going back to school. Oh, okay, okay. Oh. Well, she's technically leaving. So she can't- right, I would think just have her put it in right have, Yeah, have her put a letter of resignation in, just saying I'm resigning until whatever. Yeah, that's what I would do. Um, sorry, I was confused by the question. So we didn't really go over, over the FTEs and the reduction in wages. Uh, we went over that a lot in the prior webinar. The reason I want to go over that is because we think we think because of the dates and all that, it's really going to change. Um, but if you so one of the some of the exceptions that they did loosen up, if you had employees that resigned during your covered period or resigned during I think it was uh, February fifteenth through like April twenty sixth, if they resigned, you do not need to, and you can't rehire them back. As long as you have it in writing, then they will not count against you for your FTE count, which is great. Um, the only thing is you do have to spend money on the 75% of the payroll expense. So it's just the, you might get, does it reduce by the wage? I have to go back and look at my notes. Cause I, I, I honestly, I can't remember if it reduced, if you also reduce the wage amount and the FTE count, or if it's, if it's just the FTE, I, I apologize. I right. my notes. Aaron, you're correct. It is also the wage if it's, on, it's more than 25% of a reduction. No, I know, but if, if they resign, if they resign. Then, so yeah, I have to look back at my notes for that. Um, I'm not positive. Um, so someone wrote, did I hear you say that part of the loan may qualify for forgiveness? I thought under the current 75, 25, unless I spend it. No, no, no. Deb, they got rid of that, that cliff a while ago. We talked about that the last webinar and the webinar before that. However, so what I mean by the cliff is if you basically don't spend 75% of the amount on payroll costs, none of it would be forgiven. That's not true. They, they got rid of that cliff. It's basically a phased out, like a cal calculated phased out um, forgiveness calculation. However, with the most recent bill, with the 60%, that cliff is back. So, there, so I think it's Marco Rubio, was it? That's trying to get that um, clarify so there's no cliff. So if you don't spend the 60% on payroll, then, um, you still get the phase calculation. Um, okay. So ways to lose 
forgiveness, the pay rate reduction. So if you do have employees on payroll and you reduce their wages below 25% of what they were making before, that will reduce that dollar. There's a calculation that goes into it, but it will reduce it dollar for dollar of the below the 25. So if you, if you reduce it uh, 24%, there's no reduction, but if you reduce it 26%, there's a calculation of the difference of the, the 1% there. Um, FTE reduction, um, there's also a calculation there if you reduce those. Um, I'm not gonna go through these one by one. We did it last webinar. It is in the last, last bit of slides that we can do. Um, again, if, you, if someone resigned, you terminated them for cause, um, then you are not dinged for them. But if you just can't bring people back um, or you just don't rehire people, there is um, an FTE reduction for the give forgiveness. Other ways to lose forgiveness is bad documentation. If you can't back up what you spend the funds on and all the calculations, then they can't you know, give you forgiveness. 25% um, non-payroll cost rules. Basically, just don't, you just can't spend more than 25% for forgivable. Obviously, if you have more than 25% of non-payroll costs, you can pay for them, but just none, that won't be forgiven. And then the, this is where Debbie had that question, failing to spend at least 75% on payroll cost rule gone. So um, it's a phased thing here. So if you only spend a portion, it's okay. And then failing to spend a full amount of the loan is again, if you can't spend, let's say you got $100,000 and you, you can really can't spend the full $100,000, which I think will be, this issue will be eliminated if they, all of this will be eliminated, most of this issue is if, when they extend the timeout, hopefully. Um, so a lot of these, these points will be moved at, at then, which would be great, obviously. Um, um, it was my understanding based on the PPP loan forgiveness application instructions, the interim final rule FTE calculation caused voluntary, no, it does not reduce, if you have an employee that, that voluntarily resigned, it does not reduce it. And as an employee who works 40 hours or more on average week and employees who work less than 40 hours a week, calculation, calcula yes, as proportions of a single FTE employee and aggregated. Yeah, basically what we are recommending is you count people that work 40 hours or more as one and then you total up the rest of the hours in that pay period and divide by the number of, of so if, if, week, if, the week, if, if one week is the pay period, divide by 40. That will give you the total number of hours. Or what we were doing is taking the total hours paid, not including overtime for all employees, taking the number of hours. So if there's if there's one pay period, there's 40 hours, and we had we divide the total hours paid, divide by 40, and that gives us our FTE count. Just to be super clear, Irene, uh, overtime hours do not count in this calculation. So if you have somebody that works 45 and someone that works 35, that would not make two employees that would have 75 hours and it'd be a little bit short. Yeah, so like that, I mean, but you round up, like if you only have the two employees, right. point seven five, so you have one point five. so. Yeah. Or whatever, whatever, seven five, whatever that calculation is. Um, JB asks, under the payroll expense category list bonuses, how do they determine the bonus is fair and reasonable and forgivable as a bonus to employees for these So this is a good question, JB, actually. So this is kind of, um, this has been a constant topic among my accounting gang, I like to call them. So cool we are. Anyway, uh, <laughs> it's been a long week. Um, so we, so basically, also according to the SBA, you can get bonuses to your employees with no issues. However, we know they like to just tell us what to do. So you can either recommend you know wait until wait until the last possible week to give them the bonus if for some reason they don't do the eight week period you know extend the eight week period or um if they're getting bonuses come up with like for example um you're giving people like okay if you're in a healthcare business people are a hazard pay but or something like that hazard pay that's a bad example or they're they're working a ton like tons of overtime like my team um, because of this, because we have to, we have no choice. Otherwise we basically go under then that's, that's, you know, merited for bonuses. So, um, I don't know how deep they're going to dig into that, to be honest, but personally we're recommending people get bonuses because some people aren't coming back to work till six or seven weeks. And we're just saying, just pay them. So, um, that, that's really the only option we have at this point. 
Um, I hope that answers your question. It's kind of vague, but maybe if, if you're only giving bonuses because you're trying to spend the money, I would just sit and sit tight if you can and wait until hopefully they pass that extension and then you'll have more money to pay, you know, pay out later for your regular payroll. Susan asks, I'm a sole proprietor. I never paid myself. So using the, equi oh, oh, using the equation of net income off my schedule C, how do I actually prove that I pay myself 100% of the loan amount for my pay? What documentation provide? Amber, you want to? Yeah. Um, so the calculation, just make sure, I keep kind of pushing this through, but just make sure that you're only paying that, um, that whatever 2019 was divided by 52 times eight. Make sure that you're not using 100% of the funds if 100% of the funds doesn't cover that. So if your loan was for 15 grand, but your payroll costs are only 10, you cannot use that 5% to pay yourself through payroll. Um, that being said, we're, you know, for the most part, just setting up a new account and writing yourself out a check each week for the eight weeks with, you know, what that week compensation would have been putting payroll into that memo line. And so also to be clear, you cannot as a, as a sole proprietor, Schedule C, single member LLC, or if you're a partner in a 1065, you cannot legally take payroll in their draws. So you get on the paycheck to make it simple for the bank, right? Owner pay, but yeah. it's just, it's basically you don't want to get like, what you don't want to do is like get cash out and cash, cash it. You want to make a check payable to yourself or to transfer it directly to a bank account of your own. And in the memo, just put owner, owner, owner pay. So it's actually normal that you've never paid yourself because you've just taken money out of your business. This is the way you're supposed to do it. Um, so Irene asked the question, you can, it doesn't reduce it um, if you terminate employee for cause. However, how do you define cause? I agree with you, Irene. Um, I, I don't know what they're gonna go off, off of for that because as an example, um, Massachusetts unemployment, very liberal with giving people, you know, uh, people that apply for unemployment, we had to let someone go because they basically weren't showing up for work, which was a couple of years ago. And I had to fight it with unemployment and tell them that I had it in writing that they signed saying that they had to, to in order for them to keep their job, they had to show up to work. And, and that I fired for cause. So that's like a real thing. So I guess it just depends. I would go off of unemployment for the most part. Like if it would qualify for cause under unemployment, then I would think it would qualify for cause. Under yeah. I guess talk to um, Teresa Barbadoro, whomever you use for your HR, um, because that's, I agree with you. What's the definition of cause there? Because I was, someone not showing up to their work. I would not say, just to be super clear, I would not say cause was COVID-19, like not being able to pay them. I would think cause would be a normal reason you would have to terminate them based on their contract. Yeah. Okay. Tips are included in payroll, right? I have hourly pay, you know, they're not working, but I up their payments with tips to meet the amount they would be receiving from the generous unemployment payments. Tips are included, but if you're reporting it as tips, I think that's a bad idea. I think you just need to report it as pay because you're not, they're not actually getting tips. Yeah. If you're trying to get them to the amount that they would have gotten on unemployment, I would probably use as a bonus as opposed to a tip. Or like just wages or just, yeah. because if you're reporting tips, there's actually, it depends on the kind of entity you are. If you're an S corp, there's a call the FICA tip credit that you get. That's a huge tip credit. And if you're, I guess, quote unquote, like fraudulent or incorrectly reporting tips paid and you're getting this big tip credit for it, you're actually probably, I'm giving you advice directly on your business, but I'm just, sorry. It's just, I, I would not report it as tips. I would just give them wages just like call it wages yeah. or bonus or something. I would not, I would not pay them tips or not getting tips because you get a tax credit for that kind of anyways. Um, okay. So just, I want to reiterate this, the EIDL grant reduction. So if you received an advance slash grant from the IDL program, that was like, you, you had to have applied for it like uh, the very beginning of April, late March, you know, to get it. Um, the first was 10 grand and then it was limited to a thousand dollars per employee, whatever they define as an employee. Um, so some people got a thousand, some people got tens, but some were in the middle. Anyways, if you receive that, it will reduce the amount of your forgiveness. So let's say you got a hundred thousand dollar PPP loan, 
only 80,000 of that is going to be forgivable just because of one reason or another. But you also got a $5,000 idle advance slash grant. What that's going to do is going to take that 80,000, reduce it down by $5,000. So only $75,000 is forgivable. It's not going to, it's not going to take it off the top of the hundred thousand dollars and say that only 95,000 is forgivable. It takes it off the amount that's actually you qualify for forgiveness. Does anybody need me to repeat that? And, and that remaining amount will be payable under the terms of your PVP loan document. Okay. Wait, no. Okay, Missy, I'll repeat. <laughs> so you got your, you got a hundred thousand um, dollar PVP loan. For one reason or another, you are only able to get eighty thousand dollars of forgivable amount for the PVP loan. You received five thousand dollars for the idle advance grant. Okay, so hundred thousand dollar total PVP loan. Only eighty thousand dollars can be forgivable. You receive five thousand dollar idle advance grant. The only the amount that's actually be forgiven is seventy five thousand dollars because it reduces the amount off the top of the forgivable amount, not the total PPP amount. Um, yeah, people are confused by that. So basically just think of any amount that you get forgiven, it, forgiven and then reduce whatever you got for the idol advance. Okay, don't think of the total PPP loan amount and then reduce your idol. It's the total amount that you're gonna be qualifying for forgiveness and reduce the idol amount. Have I seen any source documents on use? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> Desmond just asked a question about the idle loans and getting mixed messages on using paying credit cards and 7A loans. So funny you should ask that question. Uh, Amber and I were just sitting here going over these lovely IFRs about the other stuff and my accounting gang just put a thing in there and say we need to do a presentation on the idle loans themselves because the idle loan um, um, stipulations and rules really revolve mainly around like hurricane type disasters, not economic, this kind of like this, this kind of pandemic disaster. So no, we don't really know what to use it. Like we have guidance. I mean, I, I actually read through the idle um, loan paperwork before I signed it with a fine tooth comb because I just really want to see it. And it's actually extremely limiting. Um, my recommendations for the idle loan, if you did get like something to approve it, you do have two months to accept it or, or to go in, hit, choose the amount you want to be approved for, and then um, they'll go back and they'll do the numbers and they'll approve you for whatever amount they feel like you're eligible for. Just because you see like a full 150000 doesn't mean you'll be eligible for that amount. Um, but what I'm recommending, if you want, or not if you want, I, I personally think that the business owner should take the loan, let it sit in account, it's such a low interest rate. It's 30 year term year, 30 year loan, 3.75. You don't have to pay it back for the first 12 months. Let it just sit in an account just in case you need the funds. And I believe they're, I, I mean, they have to change the rules on what, on the use of the funds. There's just no way they can't. And um, the, the rules are like you just said, are so all over the place. So personally, I believe that if you are eligible for the idle loan and can get it, Take it and let it sit in an account. Most small businesses are not eligible for it's really, really difficult to get financing in general. It's, and then and then the loan terms are great. You don't see that with, with um, business loans and the interest rate's fantastic. You never see that with business loans. So, and you don't have to pay for 12 months. So if it's just sitting in an account, it's okay. Just let it sit there. You can always just pay it back. Um, ugh. Many have said their line of credit have been closed because they accepted the idle both sort of asset claims. Ew, I didn't know that. I should go check my lines of credit. <laughs> we'll take Ew. a look into that, Melissa. Thanks for letting us know. Ew. <laughs> so, well, I mean, um, if, you, if you are a business and you have no access to cash at all, um, do, do take, take the loan and do first, ask for forgiveness later kind of thing. Use the money. I mean, you got to survive, feed your kids, right? I don't know. It's just personal. It's my personal opinion. Um, it's not technical legal advice here. Um, Debbie's asking, I'm planning on giving most FTE employees a rehiring bonus. That's a great idea. De that actually probably answers, I think it was JV that asked a question about like a rehiring bonus is a great way to say bonus. I think it's a great idea. Um, Deb, you said that the last time. I like that. 
Okay, for 11 of my FTE, the only pay they'll be receiving during the eight-week period of the PPP loan will be the rehire bonus. Is that okay? That's kind of what we were suggesting for some of our, especially restaurant clients, Debbie, because you can't open, so just pay them all the amount the last week or two, and they're going to get a huge paycheck. That's what else are you supposed to do? Um, but... I, Debbie, I don't know when your eight week period's up. I would sit tight and wait and not make any announcements to employees that are gonna get this $15,000 bonus, or whatever bonus you're gonna give them. The other thing you do have to be careful with, with the bonuses, you can't really be discriminatory. There does have to be some type of, um, I know Teresa, my uh, attorney friend would like me saying this, you can't just, um, you know, I can't give Amber a huge bonus just because I like her. Because I'm great. Somebody else. <laughs> or whatever, or maybe she needs it more because her family needs it more. I can't, even though that's a nice reason, I just can't do it. There has to be, you can't be discriminatory. You have to have a, um, um, some type of measurement system in place of some sort. Um, I mean, seniority is, that is, that is a, that is a thing for bonuses. So that's not discriminatory. So if you have seniority, then yeah, they could use that. Um, did we have any people that wanted to do live or the Q&A now? If you do want to speak in depth, feel free to raise your hand. We can unmute you. Just, it's just a quick question. You can still throw it in the q and I got to find the thing. Hold on. I'm sorry. I'm trying to find. Missy wants to speak. I'm going to unmute her. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I couldn't find the um. <laughs> oh, it looks like actually only you can this time, Erin. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm sorry. Participants on the bottom? A little slow right now. I don't have a bottom, that's a problem. Sorry, everybody, my brain's a little wonky today. Where is Irene? Oh, I don't see her raised hand. She put it down. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, uh, Missy, if they extend the period, can we use the PPP fund, say 16 weeks, and then S Corp owners, yes, so um, yes, do 2019. We don't know yet. That's like kind of one, one of my hesitations, honestly. I wasn't even sure if I wanted to do this webinar because everything is kind of hypothetical right now. And I, I, I don't know the answers that would make sense to me the 52 times 16, you know? It also makes sense to me that people that have had the loan funds and just spending it just because they had to should also be able to, eligible to go apply for a little bit more. That's personally my opinion. Um, but I, we don't know the answers. Um, to that, to the sort of hypothetical, what happened, what ifs. Um, if we are giving bonuses to bring our commission employees back up to what they normally would make, is that okay? I don't see why not. Um, so some of these um, questions about bonuses, you probably better off might want to ask an HR specialist. But as far as the PUP is concerned, that you, you're allowed to get bonuses to your employees. It actually even says it um, on the, it says in one of these, one of these lovely documents that I really want to read it. I'll send you the links. Um, so I will be, um, as soon as the next, the new bill is finalized and we can really iron out the rest of the details, we'll host another webinar on it all. Um, Again, if they do extend the period, the covered period, I think that will be huge for a lot of these businesses. Um, if you are on the tail end or even in the middle of your PPP loan and you're like struggling to spend the money, sit tight. Honestly, sit tight on it and wait. If you are, if you do have the PPP loan and, and you, and let's say you're limited, you're an owner and you're limited by the amount of money um, that you can take and it, it's really not covering your living expenses, um, I don't see what's wrong with you holding off on paying yourself and going to collect because you can't pay yourself enough to survive, but um, you have the funds. Doesn't mean you necessarily have to pay yourself. You also could probably do the um, reduced unemployment amount. It's the work, sh work share, I think it's called. Yeah, work share. So you can get a portion of unemployment. So we example, we have a restaurant that started up like a year and a half ago. They, the owners didn't take a big payroll at all, which is normal, especially for a new business. Their amount of payroll they can they could have lived on the fifteen three eighty five you know for the eight week period, but once it got limited, they had to stop taking payroll. They have to feed their kids somehow. They they have to go on unemployment. What else are they going to do? They can't just live off of air. So um, there's you're not supposed to be on unemployment if you're on payroll, but if you're not on payroll, 
you could be on our planet. So, um, Randy, I manage bands who tour the world playing live concerts. That's exciting. I received the PPP and Idol, but have my team on unemployment because we won't go back to work oh, until 2021. Be nice if it was 2012 right now. We could get like redos, right? Um, <laughs> will, we, will we have you? Oh, so funny today. On fire. Will we, have any, <laughs> will we have any ability to get forgiveness? So. I would say no. Uh, I guess it, we'd have to see your situation. Um, I think you would have to see your situation and just see like what they do with the, the new rules and um, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I don't want to say no flat out. I will say you'll probably get reduced forgiveness, but also it, it, it really depends. I think you have a very, very different situation. Like we have wedding venues, very similar thing to you where it, um, we have, we need to know your situation entirely to give you that kind of advice. Page, can you leave some employees on unemployment? You should be for the employees you're brought back, or is there no? So, Page, the, the the people if people aren't back at work, yeah, they can stay on unemployment. The only reason why people are bringing people back off of unemployment is to to spend the funds and to get their FTE count up. So, if they if the FTE um, count can be manipulated, like it's going to be changed a little bit, we can manipulate it to December 31st, all that stuff, or you're, oh, you're already hit it and it doesn't matter to you, then yeah, they can stay on unemployment. The, the re basically, the only reason why people are bringing people back to work that didn't have work for them was to get their FTE count up and to spend the money. So if people want to stay on unemployment, they can, but if you also, if you offered them work, we've already went over this, you can, and they refuse to come back, then, then you can call unemployment and tell them that. And then, I don't know what, I didn't know what Randy just said. I just sounded. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, what time? Is it? Oh, uh, Randy actually wants to speak. It looks like he has his hand raised, Aaron. All right, Randy. Sit down. <laughs> okay. You're welcome, Susan. Um, anybody else? Again, I, I do apologize if I know we we're going to go over the the originally going to go over the application line by line. Um, that was one of the original things we we're going to do, but I mean, there's a good chance that the application could change based yeah. on all of this. I just didn't want to, I, I, first of all, that sounds incredibly boring to me, but that's okay. <laughs> um, um, but I mean, it's important to go over obviously, but, um, we, we just didn't want to just so much information change. And then we just wanted to kind of keep this a little shorter and lighter than our normal ones. So that when we get into the next the next phase of this bill, I can really dive deep in. And anything you want to go like the, the, a lot of the stuff that I kept saying in my last webinar, if you haven't watched it, you can absolutely get it. It's on our straight line business owner survival guide. We can email it to you, um, and it, the information's there. We have the slides available. We have handouts, stuff like that. So, um, what are what are my thoughts that, about this? When this might pass? When? When I don't know. I, that's just Senate. Senate didn't even convene until yesterday at 3 p.m. So they're on some lovely vacation time. I like to be on, but that's okay. Weekend time. I'm a little bitter about the U.S. government right now. If you can't tell, um, it's okay. But hopefully, hopefully by the end of the week, the president will have it signed off. We hope. We hope. But the House passed it. What was it? What was the count? Something to one. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know what proposed changes the Senate has, if at all. I'm sure they do, they all their agendas. So hopefully they have the American people in mind with all these, unfortunately, these riots going on or the pro protests, both, whatever you want to call them, going on. I don't know if that's going to want, make them want to move faster or slower, or now these businesses that are getting damaged, uh, if they're going to want to throw something in there for them because God help these poor businesses and these areas that are getting destroyed right now that have been closed for three months. I can't, I can't even imagine my, I can't even, but how so. So the answer is hopefully soon, maybe with some tweaks. Is this all day, I guess? My yeah. Fine. When we know, we'll let you know. I know that question popped up a couple times, like what's the best way to get information? Right now, it's everywhere and it's really hard to find. So 
um, not to be partial, but or biased in any way, but if you follow our group, we are posting um, as quickly as humanly possible once we get updates. Um, the other best place to continue to look is the Department of Treasury website. That's where they've been posting the interim final rulings. So those are the best options for you. Yep. All right, well, I think we're good right now. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Marie, that's very nice. Thank you, Irene. Um, we really appreciate that. Um, just stay tuned and hopefully we'll have more information. Tell your friends. Thank you, Debbie. Happy to help. All right, guys, have a good afternoon. Enjoy the rest of your week.